Hi, everyone. Welcome to the NPA meeting. I'm Molly Flanagan. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a Ward 2 steering committee member. Uh, so we're going to get our meeting started. I'm not going to stand there anymore. So if you can hear me, please clap twice. If you can hear me, clap once. Okay, so we're going to start the meeting. I know everyone wants to socialize, so if you still want to chit-chat, please move to the hall. We're going to try to start our meeting on time. We have a lot we want to cover tonight. Um, so I'll start off, and um, we've had a few tweaks to our agenda, some last-minute um, changes to when people are available to present. And so I have the updated agenda on the screen here. So all the topics are going to be covered that are on the printouted agenda. We're just going to tweak the timing slightly. Um, so yeah, we're just going to have the Juneteenth and the Ramble happen first and the steering committee overview and then go to the Declaration of Inclusion. So if I could get a motion to adopt the amended agenda. Gina, Gina motions to adopt the uh, amended agenda. Any, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Okay, great. We have an agenda. Uh, I'll just introduce the steering committee who organizes these meetings. So I am with Ward 2. We have Lauren, who's also with Ward 2. Roxanne's with Ward 2. And Erica is in the back there. Jess Heeman is also on Ward 2 Steering Committee. Uh, with Ward 3, we have Amy, who's right there in the purple. Um, we have Charlie, who I don't think is here tonight. Um, Chris, uh, Chris and Michelle are not, also not here right now. So we have a pretty uh, robust steering committee. Uh, so they're all a resource. If you have any questions about this meeting, please come and speak to one of us. We'd love to hear your ideas. So, we are going to start off with public forum. Um, if you have anything you want to share with the community, please raise your hand. We ask you to keep your comments to two minutes, and we ask you to introduce yourself, your pronouns, what, where you live in the ward, um, and share what you have for tonight. So, I see Andrea. Thank you. Um, I'm Andrea Todd, and I live in now Ward 2. <laughs> Um, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm glad I saw Emma walk in because I wanted to make this announcement. Um, I went to the, um, and I was going to email city councilors. I don't see anybody here this evening to talk about this, but I went to the Thursday, last Thursday was the parks um, input meeting for Roosevelt Park. Um, and I, I wanted to share that um, there was a lot of good visuals and some explanations of what was going on, but um, I kind of continue to be disappointed by the um, lack of what is, is given in the community being integrated into some of those things and as well as the lack of different communities being accessed. I know they've worked better on this project to try to include more communities, but in particular, um, IAA has been um, not included in this project. They've been included the staff of IAA, but um, at the last meeting what we were, we asked that they be included. Um, an art teacher asked if they could be, um, they could work with the parks to do better in inclusive um, activities with the IAA community. And um, I was very disappointed to learn that um, Cindy and um, Sophie were not, um, that was not something that they were interested. It seemed like they tried, they said they tried to reach out to IAA and the result was that they didn't get back to them. So I'm disappointed that that's the attitude of the Parks Department um, trying to engage with our local community elementary school. So Emma, I hope you hear, I'd love to follow up with you about this because it's a, a big bummer that, um, that that's how the attitude of Parks is taking on these, um, we have three main parks in the Old North End being redeveloped, and frankly, I think that parks need some facilitating help in communicating with the neighbors in this community because they've lost a lot of trust over some of the different processes that have been going on, and it is definitely not getting better, it's getting worse. Um, so that's, my main point to the neighbors is to be reaching out to the parks department and sharing with them what you want because this is the time that they're taking input and 
I think, I hope there's more opportunities, but Thursday was one, and please reach out to your, your city council people and your, in the parks department directly for what you want for Roosevelt Park. Thanks. I'm gonna go up front. Okay, hey everyone. Um, I'm coming up here so you can all see me. My name is Polly Vanderputten. I live on Pitkin Street in Ward 2, and I'm the Ward 2 School Commissioner. Uh, school Commissioners are not officially on the agenda tonight, but I had a few updates I wanted to share with you, so I thought I'd grab my two minutes in public comment. So in, uh, in no particular order, um, Integrated Arts Academy, you may have noticed, is undergoing some pretty major construction. Um, those are ESSER funds that are being used for that. It's both HVAC work to improve the ventilation and overall heating and cooling in that building, and also a renovation that is really badly needed. And that whole entire community has been totally displaced. There are families having to go out to St. Mark's. We're working in partnership with them to have classrooms there and to have transportation for people and other people who are here. And that's gonna be ongoing. There was a drill issue anyway. Um, stay tuned, it's a really good thing, but it's a really arduous thing to have to go through that. And especially the end of the school year was rough for people. Um, also an ongoing construction project, BHS BTC. I have a list of things here that are happening. You may have noticed the steel frame, the foundation, the waterproofing. The project is happening. It's really good news. We're really happy that it's on schedule-ish, like on schedule according to the last time we were told, this is the opening day schedule, which is January 2026. So anyway, um, keep watching that over the summer. I'm hoping they're gonna keep doing really good things. Um, another celebratory thing today is it's BHS graduation. Our seniors graduated and this class was the first class that never went to the old high school. This was the class that got shut down in 2020 and they were totally remote for several months before they got into what is the former Macy's downtown BHS building. So shout out to all the teachers and kids because we have a wonderful graduating class and wonderful teachers who have made that happen. Um, my last thing is like, I guess kind of a somber topic. Um, I'm feeling okay about it now and I'm sure many of you have heard about the YES program, forensic studies and the incident that happened and I want to come and talk about it in person rather than posting something on social media. Um, basically, both the school district and the Burlington Police Department issued a joint statement taking responsibility for what happened there. It is the school district's responsibility to make sure that programming is appropriate for our students. And I think the police department is saying, yes, we didn't, whoever planned it, I don't know who planned it, really didn't think through entirely the ramifications of it. My understanding is that it was supposed to be a demonstration of testing witness reliability. And it was really traumatizing for students. And you know, like you could walk into a room and drop a cup of coffee and have people report on that. That's a, a very good way to test witness reliability rather than doing a simulation of a shooting, but anyway, um, poor judgment and also moving forward with them. I'm feeling really good about the district saying, here's how we are going to vet our programs and improve our programs. They can always be improved. And also the police department has acknowledged harm that was done. I feel that that's a really positive thing. So I just want to follow up. And if anybody wants to reach out to school commissioners, we have been getting a lot of emails. We are listening. We hear you. So that's it. Thank you. Oh, the seat. Hi everyone. I will. Did you want? Did you have a school yeah. commissioner come? I'm Jeannie. I'm the other school board commissioner representing the Old North End. There is a vacancy on the board for Ward Three. Ward Three commissioner special election in August. I believe the signatures have to be in by the 27th. I don't. You gonna? Somebody's gonna look it up. But it's soon, and it's not that many signatures, and I will help you get them if you are interested. If anybody is interested in running for the school board and serving on the school board, I gotta tell you, it's my, I'm in my fifth year, and I absolutely love it. I'm not joking. Well, good people. It's incredibly rewarding. It's, a, it's, it's, it's real, it's real work. 
Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren. I use she, her pronouns. I am a North Ave resident, so Ward 2. Um, kind of related to what Polly and Jeannie both said. Um, we have primaries coming up on August 13th. For those of you that live in Ward 2, so if you're north of North Street, your polling place is not going to be the Integrated Arts Academy because it is under construction. Your polling place will be right in here. So you should have, you'll probably start receiving postcards in the mail if you live in Ward 2, but come here if you go to IAA, nowhere to vote. Um, and for Ward 3 residents, you will also be voting on the school commissioner so that um, if you are a legal resident voter, you will be allowed to vote in that election, but none of the other elections happening on August 13th. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Okay, actually, continuing on that, so the, so there was redistricting. Wards two and three were seriously affected. And so um, as a result, almost all the poll workers that used to be in Ward three are now living in Ward two. And those people are still staffing the Ward three polling place temporarily because they get special permission, like I'll get special permission to be an inspector even though I live in Ward 2. So what I'm saying right now is that we need to rebuild the Ward 3 staff with people that live in Ward 3. So if anybody has any interest at all, if you live in Ward 3, we're de definitely looking for people to work at the polls on August 13, plus especially November. And, and until that happens, these generous people who now live in Ward 2 are going to continue to work in Ward 3. So that's fine. But we really should start to rebuild the staff for Ward 3. Okay, so if you have any interest in working in the Ward 3 polls, which is at the, the uh, Sustainability Academy, as you probably know, um, feel free to contact me by going to uh, the city departments, look for CEDO, look for... Um, the clerk treasurer's office, look, um, I'm sorry, look for CEDO and look for, okay, now I'm getting my hats mixed up here. Go to the city clerk's office and look up elections and then look for my name, Charlie, and say that you're interested in working in the Ward 3 polls and I'll get you right in there. I don't care what your political party is. We need people to work at the Ward 3 polls. Thank you. Hi everybody, um, Mayor Emma here. I just quickly looked up the election information because it was the first special election I've called as mayor, so I should know this information. So it is on the website. If, if this is for the Ward 3 special election for our school commissioner in Ward 3. The filing deadline for petitions is June 29th, so there's still a couple weeks left. And uh, just to clarify, this is being held on the same day as the primary, that's for the state elections, which is um, August 13th. And because the Ward 3 special election is a city election, all voters in Ward 3 will get a mailed ballot that is per our city ordinance, but you will not, and this is for the state legislators and everyone in the room, the state primary doesn't apply that way. So if you are out of town and you want to vote early, you will need to request through the clerk's office a ballot for the primary, that state um, election. So let us know if you have any questions. Thanks all so much. Um, my name is Lisa Schofield. I use the she, her pronouns. And I just want to tell you that the Trash Grabber Lending Library is going great. And I have two Trash Grabbers here tonight. So if anybody would like to sign them out, and you know how it's done, um, please raise your hand. Hi, my name is Ita. I use the they series of pronouns. I, am a, I work at the city of Burlington's Burlington Electric Department. Wanted to remind folks that uh, Burlington, uh, the Burlington Electric Department has an income eligibility rate um, for folks who income qualify. Um, that's 185% of the poverty level. I have the numbers right here if you want to check in with me. Um, but also if you've qualified for uh, fuel assistance, three squares, if you do energy assistance at Vermont Gas or any of these other programs, um, uh, Section 8, then you can automatically qualify for BED's uh, uh, income uh, eligible program. Um, happy to sign folks up. Also, um, uh, the process for signing up is super, super easy. Hi, Janet. Um, and thank you so much. Anyone questions, come find me, Ita. 
Hi, I'm Megan. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I work at IAA, and in our gym, we have a free garage sale with like a million books and um, tons of clothes and tons of furniture and lots of school supplies. So if you need anything and if you have any teachers in your life or any anybody who needs any free things or trying to get rid of it, so tell people. We have it tomorrow and I think Monday until like 3.30ish, 4 o'clock maybe. Just... Um, people get there at 8 o'clock, so there's just a million things, so please come and take things. <laughs> yeah. Great, we have one time for one or two more public forum, if anyone has anything. Anything burning? Okay, great. Thank you everyone, there's a lot of exciting things happening in our neighborhood. Um, Great, well we will start with our first agenda item, which is a recognition and celebration of our neighbor, um, Kurt McCormick. So I will start with Charlie G wanted to kick things off. <laughs> Okay, so hello everyone, and hello Kurt, and hello Lisa. Um, so, um, so I'm pre pretty heavily involved in the community as far as I know, but compared to Kurt McCormick, I'm like a rookie, okay? So let me just read something very quickly. There's gonna be a few mistakes in here because I kind of shuffled this stuff around, but basically I just like to read for the record that um, Kurt has a long and storied career not only is a longtime state representative, 22 years, first for Rutland and then for 10 years in Burlington here in this neighborhood, but also as a volunteer energy consultant for the Peace Corps, the AID, which he'll tell me what that means, and Partners in Health. He's been an active neighbor and tireless advocate for walkable and bike-friendly streets, affordable housing, livable wages, and more broadly, decreased consumption of energy and increased conservation of resources. Uh, and then in 2011, Kurt purchased a property that he presently lives in on Decatur and Winooski. Um, and he and his son basically brought it to, to life and they, it's known as the baby, boo, baby blue brick. Neighbors were pleased, none so more so than the ever enthusiastic bohemian Greg Nixon, who dubbed the renovated house the gateway to Decatur Street. Like many dwellings in the old North End, the baby blue brick is a material expression of its owner's hopes and philosophy. Kurt has done his best to keep his rents affordable, installed a solar water heater and electric, solar electric panels, collected rainwater for watering gardens and flushing toilets, kept up rigorous and secure co composting system, and encouraged his tenants to conserve both water and electricity. There's no dryer on the site. So Kurt is car-free car for over two decades. In both his personal and professional life, has been a daily user and tireless promoter of bus, rail, and bicycle transportation. As Vermont Bicycle Pedestrian Coordinator, in the 1990s, Kurt worked hard with others to create the Burlington Bike Path system. Similarly, Kurt kept up a strong advocacy for the extension of Amtrak, first to Rutland and later to Burlington. <clears throat> Let me just give you a quick rundown of some of the things that Kurt has done, and he can stop me if, he, if he's getting upset by my reading this. <clears throat> Kurt was a member of the Vermont House of, House of Representatives representing the city of Rutland from 1983 to 96, and represented the Old North End and downtown Burlington from 2013 to 2022. He chaired the Committee on Natural Resources and Energy for five years, in the 1990s and, and was chair of the House Senate, the Joint House Senate Energy Committee. He was the vice chair of the National Conference of State Legislatures Environment, Environment Committee. He was a representative on the NSLC as above, uh, high, high level radioactive waste repository task force. He was co-chair of the New England Recycling Council. He was a House of Representatives he was the House of Representatives representative of the Vermont Low-Level Radioactive Waste Commission. He was the vice chair of the Vermont Rail Council. He was a sponsor of Act 78, Vermont's comprehensive uh, solid waste law, 
which was the first in the nation in 1989 law that regulated chlorofluorocarbons. He was also uh, in the creation of the Ethan Allen Express Amtrak train service. He was a recipient of the New England Environmental Network Leadership Award from Tufts University. He was uh, the Vermont Bicycle Pedestrian Coordinator. He was Vermont Low Income Advocacy. He was on the Low Income Advocacy Council. He was a Vermont Low Income Advocacy Council advocate. He was Director of Advocacy for the Vermont Public Research Interest Research Group and an environmental consultant for the state of Vermont, the city of Burlington, the Peace Corps, and USAID. Um, he was also an electrical contractor. He was, in the, he was a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal from 2005 to 2008. He was the coordinator of the NCSL Committee on Natural Resources and Infrastructure 2016 and was the chair of the Vermont House Representative House Transportation Committee. So I do a lot in the community, but compared to that, I'm, I'm nobody. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jill Krewinski, and she's going to carry on. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. You did such a great job giving a full rundown of all the incredible things Kurt McCormick has done for our community and our state for decades, decades of service. And I know that there's a lot of um, former legislators, legis legislators here, and advocates who are watching online, Kurt, just so you know, there was a group of people from around the state who wanted to be here um, with you in spirit online watching and sending really strong thank you vibes your way for your incredible service. I had the honor of being Kurt's district mate the entire time he served um, in Burlington, and we had some really awesome adventures together, campaigning and knocking on doors, and Kurt always uh, had some little trick up his sleeve to keep me on my toes, and we do legislative updates, and sometimes his photo would be a little bigger than mine, or, <laughs> or someone's pin was a little bigger than mine, and it was really fun, and it was such a wonderful opportunity, not only to get to know Kurt and be friends with him, um, but also see his service in the legislature. And Kurt is probably the only chair of the House Transportation Committee not to own a car. When you talk about living your values, right? And when our chairs go out and visit members of their committee in the off session, they go all around the state in their car to visit. Kurt did it by bus and by bike. <laughs> It was awesome, and you saw that passion and those values translate into our annual transportation bill, which is now known, because of Kurt McCormick, as a climate change bill. We fight climate change through the transportation bill, which is huge. So I know that there's a lot of people that want to talk, and we have a short period of time. So, Kurt, all of us at the State House send our best, and thank you so much. And again, people who couldn't be here who wanted to say something, so I'm going to end with something from Molly Burke, a state representative from Brattleboro, who said, I value the friendship Kurt and I shared as we work to reduce carbon emissions, a theme you will hear. Kurt has lived his values, and I am so grateful for him and inspired by his example. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Sullivan. I live in the South End. I have served twice with Kurt McCormick, once through the 90s, and then when I went back in 2014, Kurt was already there. So I've known him for almost 35, no, at least 35 years. Um, I have never been in the environmental area more inspired by another human being than Kurt. I try to, you know, really live my values, and people say, wow, are you good? It's like, no, I have my friend Kurt to look up to, and he is somebody who is very, very, very good. I really, I admire you so much. Hey, I love you, pal. I've known you for so long, and you, you just live your values like very few other people do. Um, you're just amazing. Hi, I'm Carol Odie, and I use she, her pronouns. I used to live in Ward 2, and I was a school board member in Ward 2. Um, I had 
a kind of a lengthy speech because it had everything that was in the first speech. But what, I, what I'll add is um, that Kurt and I served for a time together, and he served for six years as a legislative trustee on the EVM Board of Trustees. And he was a, a tireless advocate for bicycles over buses. Right, Kurt? Um, Thank you, Kurt, for everything you've done for our state and for all of us who served with you in the legislature over all these years. And um, I'm just honored to know you. Thanks. Wonderful. I wanted to create a space for anyone on Zoom land, which we have a Zoom audience. If anyone on Zoom wanted to say anything, you're welcome to unmute. Um, so, and you know, it's hard to grasp um, the Except to say, I don't know what the narrative is. I don't know what the narrative is. I don't know what the narrative is. Kurt would ask these questions in the room. And I was like, he said, why not? Why can't you be that? Why not? And Kurt, I would say, now sometimes I kind of sat in my crawl because I was like, Wonderful, thank you so much. Does anyone else want to add anything? Well, Andrea. I'll come up here, because I'm getting a little teary, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Kurt, you're, you've been at these NPAs as well. I think it's awesome to hear about the, the really instrumental and influential things you've done for this state and for the, um, but you've also done this for our community and we see you all the time and it's awesome. And you've slogged a lot of hours here at the NPA as well. <laughs> so thank you for not just the big picture but also the community fabric that you've helped us weave too. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, well let's all give Kurt a round of applause of appreciation and thanks from all of us. Wonderful. Well, it's, it, it's tough to move on, and I wish we could stay here um, talking about successes and tough issues forever, but um, we will move on to talking about the Juneteenth um, celebration that's going to be happening in the city this weekend, and we have Pitt here to uh, give us an overview of what the city is planning and how residents can be engaged and involved. So if you want to come forward, Pitt. Thanks so much for coming. Kurt, thank you for all you do too. I really appreciate getting to know you and coming to the NPAs, even though I'm not here as much anymore, like definitely seeing you, your work and inspiration to the community. And I'm glad to be back. Thank you so much, NPA 2 and 3 Steering Committee members, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Pitt Kilmarivan, and I'm the Interim Director of REIB, um, Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Office with the City of Burlington. 
And I'm just gonna share with you just a rundown of, of this year's Juneteenth. We have a lot of great programming going on. So as you all know that Juneteenth is a federal holiday that, in, um, that marks Freedom Day for the last like enslaved peoples in Texas to hear that they're free two and a half years after the proclamation. And so it truly is about Freedom Day and also recognizing black Americans, their contributions in the culture that they contribute to our country. So um, this year, most of the um, event will happen downtown. So it's gonna be in City Hall and um, Contois, Church Street, and BCA. Uh, we have a, a lot of local acts this year, so we honed it in to support a lot of local artists in music and um, some of the things that we have is um, we have a lot of uh, vendors that are um, uh, youth vendors that we work with Burlington um, Tech Center to bring out. And so we're excited about that to highlight the local youth. And I'm going to run down some of the highlights of the programming, but you can also go to Burlington BTV to get a full schedule of this. Uh, but yeah, hopefully the weather will be good. Last time, last year it was like rainy, but we made it work and put, uh, put all of our program inside. Um, and this year we're working with a contractor um, in, uh, in, this is something that we've worked with in the past. They're um, a company called OKOK okay okay Marketing. They're a local BIPOC uh, marketing uh, company. So they put on a lot of like the, the talent and they help coordinate the event and REIB serves as a curator of um, the overall programming. Uh, so we have um, uh, basically um, some of the highlights we have is the Supper Club. The Supper Club is um, a um, it's a long table where everybody can come and eat together, and um, we have local BIPOC vendors there. All, all the food is free, and um, some of the vendors we have there are making the Crux Barbecue, um, Soul Food, Harmony's Kitchen, and um, we also have some sweets uh, that is by, let me see, um, by, Lulu's Kitchen, Jamaican uh, Supreme, and uh, Kiss Mayo. Uh, and starting at 11, we will have on Saturday, this is, sorry, Saturday the 17th, Saturday the 15th, so this coming Saturday, we will have a gospel brunch, which we've had uh, for the three years that we've been doing it. Um, and uh, they are going to be singing, um, gospel songs, and there'll be brunch where people can come and eat together. Um, then we have lineup of um, DJs that will be playing until 11. We have um, educational workshops. So this year we're gonna be focusing on uh, uh, black youth mental health, which will be put on by UVM Medical Center. We also have, um, it, with Champlain Housing Trust, a um, workshop about home buyer um, seminar, which really focuses on first time homeowners. And um, yes, let, let's see what other things are highlights. Um, and we will have a lot of activities that will be throughout uh, the, the park and it'll be free haircuts called Fades, uh, Fades and Braids. Uh, we will have roller a roller rink where it will be um, by the Joy Riders, and um, a kids area that will have face painting, uh, tennis uh, tennis ball called uh, Kids on the Ball, and um, and of course like uh, uh, poets and performances through dance theaters, like black owned dance theaters, um, that um, is called Dance Theater Vermont and also the ALV Youth Dance. And yeah, so we have a lot of programming going on. It's all gonna be like it within the downtown. downtown um, and it is starting from 11 and will end at 11. 
in, I could list off like all the talent we have, but it's, honestly, it's gonna be like 80 people. And so it's a full pack day. So I don't, I don't wanna bore you all more by reading it down. This is all on like the website. So I'll open it up to any questions that you have about Juneteenth. Great, thank you. Let's see. Can you give us an update about the sculpture in Dewey Park? Please yeah. and thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, so yes, we, um, as of um, this week, we did hear from the artists that the fabrication was delayed. So unfortunately, we did have to postpone it. I mean, we felt like that um, it's better to postpone it than to have an event without the sculpture there. So it. There's an event coming up. I don't know if you heard the rambles coming up. The rambles um, for what day? July 27th. Well, hopefully it won't be a conflict um, because it's, it's the 26th. Like that would be a great day for it to happen. Oh, okay. Oh, I can definitely be back, but yeah, definitely. Uh, if uh, if you all are interested in having the monument par be part of the ramble, then we definitely will welcome that. It's a good idea. But yes, it, um, so we definitely can be able to discuss this after too. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? So yeah, I mean, thanks for having me. Um, and Juneteenth, um, there's a lot of like effort that has gone behind it with different city departments. Uh, businesses, it does really bring up um, a lot of economic development, specifically for our black and brown vendors um, and artists, and um, it is all for everybody, you know, um, because it is about, again, celebrating um, community and freedom, and, um, and there's a lot of great events and food, and come on down. Wonderful. Thank you so much oh, for presenting. Sounds like a great day. All right, thanks for having me. Bye. Moving on from uh, Juneteenth to the Ramble, Jeannie's going to give us a presentation about that festival and how you can all help support it. Thank you, Molly. So, yes, the Ramble is an annual celebration of and for the Old North End. It's been going on since 2004, and I have slides. Do um, you want to go to the next one? Thank you. That means this year we're turning 20. Wow. So this is kind of a big deal. The idea was originally hatched um, by Lee Anderson, who owns Radio Bean, probably you know him, and Heather Sanders, formerly Driscoll, who used to live on Rose Street, also was an AmeriCorps Vista. I was an AmeriCorps Vista as well. Um, she, the two of them were like, hey, how come the old North End is always getting a bum rap? It actually rules. We all need to just do our cool thing on the same day and tell everybody in Burlington a couple of things. In addition to, you should come and see how cool we are. So the idea of organizing everybody or encouraging everybody to do their thing, have a special at your restaurant, set up that I mean, it's too, it is too many things for me to even start listening. But routinely, we've had historical tours. Preservation Burlington has participated probably for the entire 20 years. Uh, field days has been going on out of Battery Park. It used to be a cool war of the wards, like South End versus North End. Now it's more like the best kid activity to start the day. Um, but Overall, it is about we make this opportunity, we connect people, so say you have an idea and you want to do something, but you don't know where to do it, but say you have this awesome garage, but you're not necessarily about to like break out your drum set. Maybe we can connect you with 
the experimental percussion band that needs a place with decent acoustics and your garage is it. You never know, but that happens all the time. So, next slide, I guess is probably the next thing. The idea is that all of this connecting, all of this shared goal, all of this working together, we're gonna form our relationships, we're gonna, it's gonna foster a connection, and also it's most likely going to bring some commerce into the Old North End. So this is also an opportunity for people to try out their small business. Like this is your little, what do they call it? Test your pilot, or whatever, you, whatever you, however you want to put it. Um, and okay, so for the longest time, so this has been like a shoestring operation forever. It still kind of is. It, it definitely still is. But we did have a fiscal umbrella for a while. It was, I believe it was CEDO. And then, and we used to get block grants. Remember CDBG grants? We always got a solid $1,000. We actually threw the ramble with like $1,000 probably like three years in a row. And th it just really kind of like was a hit, so it kind of got bigger. The main expenses were things like printing maps. We've been able to move away with that thanks to the you know, smartphone in everybody's hand now. Accessing, getting information delivered to you doesn't necessarily mean hitting up Vantage Press for a discount. Um, but we always had a fiscal umbrella that eventually had to, we had part ways with a VPAL and we are now a nonprofit LLC, but not a tax exempt 501c3. So as much as we want to get grants, we can't necessarily apply for certain ones the way we used to be able to with that fiscal umbrella. We have shopped around a little bit. It hasn't quite worked out, but being an annual event, a one day thing, it kind of doesn't make sense for us to go through the whole, let's become a nonprofit. So this is where we are right now. This is what our bandwidth can kind of like manage. So technically we have to have a board. I'm the chair. Jennifer Blair has been the treasurer and I didn't even know for how long, at least 16 years. And Alicia Taylor is our newest member. Jenna Chris Caden formerly was our secretary. As many of you probably know in this room, Janet passed away. Um, I used to call her the glue, the glue and the goo gone to, to the ramble. <laughs> Anyway, Alicia has been doing tons of tech support behind the scenes, um, networking, and she's the person that is in charge of making sure the website doesn't look horrific. In fact, it looks fantastic, thanks to Alicia. Um, all right, next slide. So how does it actually really, really work? All day long, depending on when somebody says they wanna host an event, as early as that, to as late as somebody wants to host an event. That's how long it goes. It's gone to three o'clock in the morning. It started at, you know, sunrise before. We never really know, but basically it's all day and very late. The main event, because of noise ordinances, we always stop at 10 p.m. We get a hard stop at 10 p.m. Although we do flyer the neighborhood telling people, heads up, it might get a little loud. And of course we invite them. Um, so yeah, throughout the neighborhood, everybody's got these little things going on and we make a map to tell you where to go. We encourage people to, hey, this part of the Old North End, if you want to set up shop, do it between 10 and 12. Okay, now we're in the middle of the Old North End. Do that between like four and six. Um, next slide, please. So yes, we're acting as a hub. We are trying to encourage you to do something, but we're also, well, next slide. There's more than one way in which we facilitate or organize people having events. There are people that have their own gig, but if you are interested in doing anything, go onto the website, the host an event button will take you to a form. There's a couple questions. Even if you just have an idea, of course, if you have an idea and you want to run it by us, please email. It's the 
O-N-E, and it's got a period in between each, ramble at gmail.com. I am no longer the coordinator. I'm just subbing today. Thea Dicey is the new coordinator. She had to do some other stuff. Um, yeah, I'm really psyched that there's a new person totally taking this on. No, there's like a new wave of people that have uh, stepped in. And the, the, the former people, the people who have been doing this since 2004 are, feel absolutely energized by their, I don't know, stewardship, I guess you would say, uh, taking it to the next generation. Yeah, I think that's actually happening 20 years, right? Um, all right, so the next slide will also talks about there are staple events that happen, and most of these are spearheaded autonomously, but happen on the same day. So the, uh, the One World Market, that is something that is an initiative or hosted um, out, of, out of CEDO. And, but it's also got Jason, who's been doing sound for the One World Market and the, Ram and the Ramble Roundup for how long? It's, it's been a long time. Um, but that's part of how we got a job here, by the way. The Ramble, the Ramble changes lives, guys. <laughs> Which is actually true. People have like, gotten married at the Ramble. People have decided to live in Burlington. They were like, we're out of here, we're out of here. And then like, the Ramble changed, changed my mind. True story. Um, so staple events like field days, One World Market. So One World Market, if you are interested in vending, food or vending art or vending crafts, whatever. There's somebody who won, I don't know if she's gonna do it again, artful mending. There's, there's something new every year, you know, Hannah tattoos, hair wraps. It, it, there's something different every year. But that is the place that the Ramble would say, if you come to us and not go directly to the One World Market, we would say, hey, there's actually a gig for that. Here's the form for that, or I'll get you in contact with those people. Um, Decatur Fest is probably the best block party that's ever going to happen in the state of Vermont. It's been going on for a long time. Yep, very well organized. They, uh, the Ramble has a theme every year, and Decatur Fest, you know, we take turns. Like, am I going to, like, do a riff off of your theme, or are you doing a riff off of my theme, you know? So, but it's always coordinated to complement each other. Um, so Decatur Fest has their own lineup of, of shows, their own theme, their own, does any, is anybody from Decatur Fest want to talk about it? Or, or do you want to just, as this, do you want to give us the two things, what was the coolest thing about Decatur Fest? Everyone participated. Everyone participated. Everyone had fun. Everyone had fun. Everyone had something good to eat. True. Everyone sold their stuff. Everyone was happy. This is true. Yep. There, and Decatur Fest is one of the places that often has a huge barbecue for everybody, too. So they're supporting the staple events. The, like another thing is uh, there's, a big, there's a big bike ride that happens, usually leaving Decatur Fest. You know, it's always TBD to, to be announced. But then ending up at the Roundup. And the Roundup is the big thing that the coordinator um, for the Ramble oversees. And that's the, the big stage. Jason's doing sound. We've got a beer garden, food trucks. The, it's just fun. I know, I think at least five bands are booked at this point, but I don't know who they are because I'm not the coordinator anymore. I'm just subbing. Does anybody have any questions? Roxanne did the Google map for the first time, right? Right? Okay, raise your hand if you've helped with the ramble before. Nice, okay, good job. Gene, you haven't? You should feel horrible. <laughs> Maybe this year's your year, Gene. I don't know what Emma's doing. She usually does garden tours. I heard she might be busy this year. Thanks, Jeannie. Okay, Any questions? Actually, so What's that? Yes, Circus Spectacular. So let me tell you about a few of the other things that are happening there. So I'm the guy that runs around with the camera and I record that event, okay? Oh, and yeah, so that's right. some of Thank my you. Did you raise your hand? 
No. You, help, you helped with Rambo. Oh, I helped with Rambo. Okay. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, but see, some of, the, some of the interesting things that end up on the calendar, like there's these two little girls that have a, a lemonade stand every year somewhere on Hyde Street. Okay? So I, I get like a 30-second clip of that so that now when they see me walking up, because they, they know I'm looking for them, they run. They run to get their mother to get permission to get on the film. Okay. <laughs> Other people have tea the parties. Got to sign the waiver. <laughs> so you can have a tea party on your porch and get on the schedule, and people, total strangers, are going to come to your porch during the day just to have tea. Or you can give away free hot dogs on your porch, or you can have a live band in your backyard. You can sell your pottery or your paintings right off your front porch, and you get on the schedule, and all these strange people will come to your house because they know that you're on the schedule. And so there's lots of fun things that happen that day, and I encourage people to participate in it. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Great. Any questions? See you at the Rambo. Yep. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, now we're going to have a presentation from Roxanne about your opportunity to join the NPA Steering Committee. All right, hey everyone. Um, so if you're still here at this point in the meeting, this, this presentation is for you. <laughs> um, I'm Roxanne Muse. I'm on the NPA steering committee for on the Ward 2 side of it. And I'm just gonna take a few minutes to share what it is we do on the steering committee with the hope that um, it might inspire some of you to consider joining, um, especially come September, we'll have some more openings. So, uh, the steering committee is here to make sure that the NPA is staying true to its purpose. The purpose is based on the original resolution from like 1982, um, but it can really be summarized as connecting residents with city government. Um, and as we all know, it's really also about connecting neighbors to each other, even if that's not an official purpose. Um, so here are some basics of the steering committee, uh, and, and these are all according to our bylaws. So we can have three to six members per ward um, on our joint ward two and three committee. Voting for them is by ward. Uh, we have one-year terms, and you can do up to four terms in a row before you have to take a year off, and then you can come back. Uh, if there are openings, we can fill those at any time, but September is the official start-end date, and when we will always vote on new and renewing members. And the only requirement, um, or the only yeah, eligibility requirement is to be an NPA member, which just means you're a resident and you're 14, at least 14 years old. So these are your current steering committee members for each ward. Like I said before, we can have as many as six per ward. So we do currently have one opening in each ward, if anyone wants to join today. Um, but come September, Molly and Jess Hyman um, will have hit their term limits. So thank you for your four years of service to Molly and Jess. Um, and I'm uh, not renewing after um, a couple of years. So um, that's where those blanks come from. So especially in Word 2, we need people. Um, and there might be other openings, but that's like who we know is not re-upping. So there are a few things that all of us on the steering committee do um, that I want to share so that if you're interested, you, ha you have an idea of the basics of like what the work is like, what, um, what it is we do. Uh, so meetings are part of this, obviously. We have this meeting. The steering committee has one meeting a month where we meet basically to plan this and to go over any other uh, matters that we have to cover. 
Uh, those are both Thursday nights. Um, this one probably like won't change, and the steering committee one, it depends on our schedules, but the Thursdays tend to be what works, so it's not that it couldn't change, but like it helps if you're free then. Um, and then every year we do try to have a couple other meetings where we talk about bigger picture stuff, like how can we engage with the community better? How can we do more outreach? Um, how can we make meetings more accessible? Um, how can we better organize ourselves? What should we do with our funding? Um, so those are the kinds of things that are harder to fit into those monthly meetings we have. Um, and then we take turns preparing for this meeting. So as a group, we all agree, like this is what we're gonna have on the agenda and that's based on requests we get, ideas we have, what's going on in the city. Um, but then two people um, go off and do all the little details. They email the presenters, might have some back and forth there, schedules change, you adapt, you communicate with your buddy. Um, you finalize the agenda because that we have to, you know, post, warn to the public. Uh, so all those details, it's two people that work together every month and we take turns. And um, lastly, and this overlaps with all of the above, but I think it's a good one to call out that um, one of the things we do like with our time is like Talk to, we brainstorm together, we um, make decisions together as a team, um, mostly during those meetings, sometimes over email. So those are the essential things we do to keep this running. Um, but here's, um, yeah, here's a list of things that need to happen, but not everyone has to do all of them. So if you have a certain strength or interest, you can do more of that and less of the other thing. You'll notice some of us facilitate more and some of us avoid it at all costs. Um, so facilitating is one of them. Uh, taking notes. Updating our social media and website. Um, so if you're you know, good with Canva, Instagram, Linktree, Weebly, or if you want to learn them, um, those are things we use. Uh, staying on top of city and state happenings, that's like a collective thing. We all try to help out, but some people just, I don't know, tend to keep up with that stuff more. We have Erica especially, she's our ringer for the state house to know what's going on. Um, we have to keep ourselves organized and some t and I think like Molly has done a good job of that, of like facilitating our steering committee meetings, um, making sure we all know that we have it, <laughs> uh, stuff like that. Yeah, so internal stuff. And then miscellaneous, of course, there's all these little things that we do. Um, and that's maybe where you can fit in your idea here. So if you think, of some way you could contribute that you'd like to contribute, but it's not here, you know, you can still do it. Please do it. Please come and help. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, so that was all about how, you know, you can serve on the steering committee to support the NPA, but um, there's stuff to gain as well, um, which I think is especially to point out because this is a volunteer position. It is like a certain amount of time per month. So um, what do you get out of this? Um, I'd say there are some practical skills. I know for me that's been the case. Um, even just watching other people facilitate meetings when it goes well, it's like, oh, like this is amazing. I didn't know it could be like that. Um, public speaking or participating in a group discussion, all that good stuff. Um, and this can be an inspiring role, like when it's a grassroots volunteer group and you get to do meaningful work and bring a lot of people together and um, have everyone from the mayor to like really involved citizens, like um, it's pretty cool. So you can get that from attending, but when you take part, it's even better. Um, yeah, uh, and that also, you know, just is fulfilling. Uh, and lastly, but not leastly, it's just a way to get more connected, um, you know, through, you're probably gonna end up going to more NPA meetings than you otherwise would. Um, and yeah, so just more chances to meet people, more chances to work with, <laughs> oops, time's up. Um, uh, yeah, 
And okay, summarizing. So if you thought all that sounded okay and all this sounds good to you, consider joining the steering committee, please. Um, if you're interested, let one of us know. You can email us, you can send, give us a note. Um, words two and three at googlegroups.com. Um, we also like to make sure you know you know, you can learn more about it and know what you're getting into. We have like, can have like a really informal chat. Um, you can attend a steering committee. Anyone can do that anytime. Um, and then we ultimately hold a vote if you're interested. So any questions? Thank you so much, Roxanne. We have time for one quick question. Eric, it looks like you're If there it. are no questions, do we want to have everyone go around who's on the steering committee so people can identify and then come and talk to people afterwards? Everyone raise your hand if you're currently on the steering committee. <laughs> come and say hi to us if come you have any hi. questions. <laughs> We'd love you. to talk to you. Thank you so much, Roxanne. That was excellent. So next on the agenda, we have Ali Dang to speak to a declaration of inclusion but I'm not seeing him here. Do you know, have an update, Chris? Oh, excellent. Ali, are you able to unmute and give us a presentation? Good to have you. Thanks for coming. Wonderful. Thank you for that overview. Um, we have printouts on the tables that look like, that look like what Lauren's holding up. Um, so, there is, on the side that she's showing you, is the proposal for the declaration that our NPA would vote on. And then the back side is the copy that is on the website that Ali referenced that is a um, form for uh, um, any organization or town to consider passing. Um, so we would open, we, uh, we'd, we'd like a motion from the floor to um, vote on whether this ward wants to... Um, to vote on this declaration. Is there a motion to that effect? Chris. Declaration of inclusion. I'd like to move that the wards two and three MPAs adopt the declaration of inclusion. Thank you, would anyone like to second that? I would second that. Great. Thank you, Jean. Um, is there any discussion? Okay. Did you want to say I was just going to say that uh, this was something that had come to the all wards NPA from wards four and seven. So we're doing our part, but I think the goal here is to get all of the NPAs on board. And I think with our uh, vote tonight, we may be halfway there. Great. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no further discussion. Everyone in favor of voting for the Declaration of Inclusion for support of the Ward 23 MPA, raise your hand. Thank you. Anyone voting no? Seeing none, we, we pass our Declaration of Inclusion. Thank you. The, uh, the steering committee will work to um, make this an actionable action and making our community more, uh, more inclusive. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ali, for joining us um, to present on this topic. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, we will move on to our next agenda item, which is hearing from city councilors with a particular focus on an update with the city budget. Um, we will ask them to talk to how uh, the budget proposal is coming together and what the impacts to the city might be. I wasn't going to talk about the budget. Sure. Sure. Here, go, go first. I'll talk about the budget after. Cool. You, go, you go first. Well, what I was going to do and what I always do is encourage people to actually watch the city council meetings or at least part of them. And I think it's really important to watch 
what Emma says. Can I call her Emma? Are we good with that? Excellent. Because the way she's being misrepresented is not okay. So it's important that you watch and hear the words coming out of her mouth. Um, the, closing this gap has not been easy. It's been very, very difficult. And I think the steps that we were taking, and, and Gene's gonna have some more details and he's gonna be, um, Joe's under the weather tonight, but we have some notes from him with regards to his observations. Um, when we say that, yes, the people of Burlington voted for up to three cents on the public safety uh, tax, but we only took two cents because why should we hit residents with all three cents? So it's, it, it is really using a lot of different options that have been outlined in Board of Finance meetings and City Council meetings. And I think it's really important for people to pay attention to what's going on. I think it's really important to pay attention to what's going on about the encampments. Uh, there is a lot of misinformation, disinformation going on. These people have no place to go. They have no place to go. And that is a stark reality of what is going on. Um, someone said to me they were being rewarded with porto potties. And this is a good person. This is a good person who's actually very much involved in trying to help people in our downtown, but he's very frustrated with what's been happening, especially with the the drug crisis. But nonetheless, porta potties are not a reward when we talk about human waste constantly having to be cleaned up because people have no place to go. So um, we'll hear more about that. I think it's important to listen to Emma in terms of how she is addressing this, and I fully support it um, personally. I do want to remind everyone that Juneteenth is happening this Saturday. You might have heard about it a little bit earlier when they talked about the embrace and belonging, but I just really want to encourage everyone. This is going to be a wonderful celebration. There's lots of stuff for kids. There's free hair care. There is going to be an eventual play playground for younger kids. Joy Riders will be holding a World Bounce Rock Skate event in the afternoon in City Hall Park. Um, there will be a supper club on the BCA patio. Free food, yummy food from a variety of vendors, drinks, ices, etc. There's going to be many performances, including uh, young musicians and performers from Burlington High School um, and the uh, technical unit. Jay Kalu will be performing. Uh, shout out to Andrew Champagne, who is a just a warrior when it comes to registering voters. He's registered over 1,800 people. So spread the word. If you know anyone's not registered to vote, show up. Let Andrew do this thing. Maybe we can get him over 2,000 um, voting right now. That that's our power. That's our power. Um, we need to use it to vote against Governor Scott. Hint, hint, because he does not care about Burlington, and people really need to wake up about that. Second highest paid governor in the United States. Oh! And he's doing nothing for Burlington. He does not care about us. Uh, please email uh, Senator Chittenden, who has not been supporting overdose prevention centers, they are, it's crucial for Burlington. So uh, the fact that a Chittenden County, County Senator would not be supporting that is just amazing to me. Uh, what else did I want to, oh, you might see one of your favorite DJs Saturday. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Um, Birdman's things were near Dewey Park. The Parks Department has very kindly agreed to store them. Uh, right now we're looking at up to six months. So some people have been talking about trying to come up with a way to memorialize him with his things, but we didn't want to leave it out in the weather. And, and so just for people who have ideas, reach out to me. We'll try to get a group of people together um, to look at that. Um, and I, uh, oh, I want to also mention on Juneteenth, there will be some events at the Richard 
Kemp Center as well. Thank you. Okay, is it on? Oh, it is. Okay, so the budget. It's, um, it's actually really exciting because all of those roads, those sidewalks, those parks, those firemen, et cetera, that uh, we depend on are funded by the budget. And um, it's not a, a, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody in this room that we have had um, a serious gap to fill. Uh, the city is not allowed, I don't think the state is allowed to run deficit um, budgets. Maybe the state is allowed to run a deficit, but the city, they don't, but the, but the city is not allowed to run a deficit budget. So, you know, and there's no money to like pull, there's not a printing press to, to pay for it. So um, when Emma came in, it was discovered that we were many millions, and the number has gone up to about 14, I think, uh, million dollar gap. So this is not insignificant, although some of that money um, is related to the retirement fund. And so let me just start, I, that's sort of the, the, the basic overview. But we all pay city taxes whether we are owning our homes or whether we're renting. So. Let me just give you what the changes in the tax rate that are proposed now. And this, this budget is to be voted on on the 24th of this month, and we're still working out details of it. But um, the general city tax, the general property tax, is not slated to rise, okay? So we have kept that flat. But the police and fire um, splinter tax that we all, collectively, the city, and I was like overwhelming, and we spoke about this, I supported that, uh, to raise it um, in, at, in March by three cents. Emma is proposing to raise it by two cents. And let's be clear, municipal property taxes, and I have said this every time that I've come here, are not income sensitized in the, state of, in, in the city of Burlington for general services. It is not a progressive, tax. So, not based on the ability to pay. So, the question is if we're going to pay for um, public or community safety, how do we do that? How do we raise that? And one proposal that came up um, to lower the property tax on for the, the, the one of the three cents was to increase by a half a percent the meals and rooms, uh, meals and alcohol and entertainment gross receipts tax we have, which means that if you if it, if it if we increase the ordinance um, and do that, that a um, hundred dollar um, meal would cost an extra fifty cents, and it you know in my mind going out to eat is a real privilege. And I, I do it on occasion, but um, it's disposable. Housing is not a, it seems to be a privilege in, in our town, but it's not a privilege. It's a, it's a human necessity and right. And we, you know, uh, and this is a way that in, in, in my mind, and I actually proposed that we do this and been pushing even when Moreau was uh, the mayor to increase that, um, was, uh, is a way to uh, to do that. Come on, Jeannie, get your numbers here. Thank you. So, the one cent um, in the splinter tax for um, police and fire services is going. It, it, the proposal is to use this half a percent on the meals and alcohol and entertainment gross receipts tax to cover that. So, um, but the, the parks, splinter taxes, we have a bunch of splinter taxes, dedicated taxes that, uh, that we have decided, okay, we wanna know where our money is going, and so it's gonna go to parks, it's gonna go to the streets, and none of those taxes are being uh, proposed to be increased, um, but we also have funds, I'm sorry, Molly, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, 
you know, everybody's paying for us, so it, it might make sense for us to take as much time as you can afford for me to do this, because uh, I, I think I'm trying to get there quickly. Um, but there are some um, taxes that we actually, we have to pay, but we are not um, in sort of like in charge of, except to say yes. So if the bus system has a tax and they've got to, uh, uh, they've got to use local um, assessments uh, to, to fund it. And I, I have to say there's been an issue, we've brought this here in terms of GMT funding, the legislature, uh, and with all due respect to my friendly legislators here, needs, to, let me put it this way, needs to do more to have a real system. But right now we don't, and the, the, the bus tax is gonna go up um, a little bit when all is said and done. It's like, it's still gonna be within the three cent range, but um, a little bit. Um, and uh, the pension that we pay for city workers is part of the deal that uh, we've made with our union and non-union people for the public service that they do. And there's an automatic increase in uh, the retirement tax when it falls below the um, amounts that need to be um, put in there. And that is gonna go up four cents. That was something that was actually a surprise to Emma when she saw that. Part of the deal that we've got is we know that people have limited income. So if the retirement tax has to be raised, then it gives us less elasticity for the, um, the other funds and the other ways of revenues, which is why the gross receipts tax becomes so important and other taxes which are based more on an ability to pay and discretionary income are so important. Um, so according to our um, person, Joe Kane, who is on the, um, the finance board, which is, is good, he says, he could, he's, like Milo said, he's sick tonight, um, that uh, a house assessed at uh, $500,000 should see a jump of about $100 in monthly housing costs, and 60% of that is actually driven by the education tax increase. Um, and education taxes are, are income sensitized. Uh, there are issues with that, but that's important uh, for us to do that, and the 33% uh, uh, are on those higher uh, municipal taxes that I talked to about, and then 10% are driven by uh, higher rates for electric, water, and recycling. And rather than go into the expenditures, I'll leave that to questions because Molly gave me a minute and I can be within the minute if I stop blathering. <laughs> um, and uh, you can ask questions about, okay, well, what y'all paying, what are you paying for? with all of this money. Thank you, Gene. Yeah, never enough time to talk about any of these things, but I think we can make time for two questions. So, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Nora, she, her pronouns, Ward 2. I was just wondering if there's somewhere we can go online um, to just kind of try and digest this a little bit more. Uh, yeah, so if we had, there are a lot of documents that were posted on the city council's calendar for the meeting that we just had on Monday night. And it's in, th there's a list of them, so you go to the calendar, uh, you go to, uh, and I did, well, I, I pulled it up, but I can't remember. It's the last item on the deliberative agenda, and you click that open, and all the documents uh, are there, the tax document that I, the tax numbers that I got um, were from one of the documents that I downloaded. So that's probably the most up-to-date uh, place for the details of that. And then if people have specific questions about line items or anything in particular there, uh, you should feel free to reach out to me, to Milo, to, to Joe, and our, we will do our best. It's, our note taker, Roxanne, is gonna link to them in the meeting minutes if you look for them there. That'll be They'll great. Be it, it's really important that everyone learn how to use Civic Clerk. It really is, and they have made it easier. Just going to the city's website, clicking on the calendar, looking for the, the meeting that you're interested in, and then clicking on the documents. And uh, this Monday is the most recent budget update, and it would be good to uh, watch Emma talk about um, things around the budget, and once again, things around the encampment near the dog park. 
Great. Who wants the last question? Great. As long as nobody else has a budget question, I am ever curious if there's new thoughts about how to get the F-35s out of the skies. Um, I have been waiting for my uh, colleagues uh, who are working on uh, the congressional delegation. Really the way, the, and I think the only way that we can remove uh, that basing is to get the delegation to request the uh, Secretary of the Air Force to find another mission. And I have um, been waiting for the, the folks um, who are working inside with the delegation uh, for the okay for me to bring that to the city council. And I think that we would bring it to Winooski City Council and South Burlington City Council. We probably, if we passed that, would get it into uh, Colchester's, everybody who's in the flight path, Williston. Um, but that really is the way to do that. Um, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm prepared to do that. And every day uh, when they come over, I think about it. I just want to take 30 seconds, something I wanted to mention earlier. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me about my no vote uh, to reappoint Chief Murad. I feel I've been very consistent uh, going back to since I was a police commissioner. The same issues are still in play. I believe our current mayor will put a plan in place. And that was something our previous mayor refused to do. I don't know how anyone looks at the drug crisis and our wards, right? Because we've been hit the hardest. We were hit first the hardest. And I begged them, Miro and Murad, I begged them. And they wouldn't come up with a plan. And I don't know how anyone can look at what's happening and think he's doing a, a good job. I just think it's, you know, and then two days later, my vote didn't look so bad after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks for all your hard work and for coming to our meeting. Great. If, if people have questions about the budget, uh, definitely reach out uh, to us. Thanks. Wonderful. So we'll move on to Jess's announcement. Thank you for letting me interrupt for just a moment. I just want to make sure that everyone knows that we have a bunch of leftover veggies and food on that table. Um, we need them all to go home and be eaten. So before you leave today, please peruse the veggies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to our last agenda item, which is also our longest and um, most timely, maybe. Um, Maybe. Um, <laughs> we invited our state um, legislators and senators to come and give us an update on the session that just wrapped up and a preview to the veto session, which is coming. And so we'll give them about half an hour to give us updates, since there's a number of them. And then we'll have at least 10 minutes for questions. So please think of your questions. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, that would Can be Can we do like smart. hand signals? Like, <laughs> like, okay. Do we? We might need like flares. We have legislators, you know? Okay, this is. How long do we have? Um, five minutes. If we go over, can you, can you start doing what they do with the city council meeting? Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Do we, members, do we want to start on one end and go around? What works for folks? 
I'll just go. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Jill Krowinski. I am. Uh, I represent the Old North End in downtown Chittenden 16. I also serve as the Speaker of the House, and I'm sorry we weren't able to be here at the last meeting, but we were deep in debate in the legislative session, second to last day. So uh, it's it's great to have uh, that behind us. We did some really exciting things, and now we are preparing for a veto session, which is happening on Monday, possibly could be going to Tuesday. Uh, and at the end of today, the final uh, bills were returned back to us. There are seven vetoes from the governor, seven. And so, I'll, and these are all really important bills that um, really support what we care about here in the Old North End and in Burlington. And so, um, I'm going to just go through high level some of these, and then I'll let um, others go do a deeper dive uh, because we're all, we all represent different committees or in my position, I'm not on a committee. Um, so uh, House, the, the data privacy bill was vetoed. Our Act 250 uh, <laughs> land use uh, and housing bill was vetoed. Uh, the, the restorative justice bill uh, was also vetoed. Uh, as you heard mentioned earlier, the overdose prevention site pilot bill uh, was vetoed. The renewable energy standard bill, <laughs> which we, I know have been working on, which is 100% renewables by 2035 was vetoed. And then uh, the neonics bill uh, that protects bees from harmful chemicals was vetoed. And then the last one is the yield bill, uh, which sets our education um, tax rates was vetoed. That bill was a hard fought compromise to ensure that we were funding school budgets, that we are meeting the needs of schools across the state. And I think, I don't know if any of our school board members are here, but I just want to give them a shout out and thank them. Oh, you're right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Martine, thank you. My goodness, um, I know Polly and Jeannie were here earlier, um, but it, it was uh, really frustrating with the governor um, coming up with some really short-sighted proposals that would really impact our schools, uh, like eliminating the universal school meals program, which our kids really benefit from. So uh, I can tell you that um, and we are working very hard to ensure that we have the votes to override these critical bills um, and make sure that they get across the finish line because it's so critical. And I'll just say, you know, we have a governor who is n does not feel a sense of urgency around climate um, and prefers that we just stay the course and do more EV charging stations instead of <laughs> bigger, more thoughtful, impactful policies. And uh, I think it's important uh, that people see that in these vetoes and how um, we can't be going backwards. We need to be going forward. And it's the same thing when it comes to our justice system. And it's the same thing when it comes to housing and working families. And I could go on and on. So my time is up. I will be knocking on doors and around uh, giving my end of session report out to give more details. And I'm always around if you have questions. Thank you. Are we sticking with vetoes, or if you want to do, do you want to do a deeper dive on one? Sure. So it sounds like we're going to stick with the um, bills that have been vetoed, and maybe do a little bit of a deeper dive on a few of them. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the yield bill because I, um, this past session, I was vice. Oh, thank you. Yes, my name is Martine Larock Gulick, and I am a school commissioner and a state senator um, in Chittenden Central, and I represent on the school board um, Ward 4, so I live out in the New North End. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I can't assume people know who I am. Uh, let's see, so the yield bill, there was a provision in the yield bill that would have put together a commission on the future of public education in Vermont. And I was really excited about that because it's, um, it would have been a group of folks statewide that would really dig into not just the economics of our education system, but also just the efficiency of it, um, the way it's delivered, what the legislative role is in education, um, the AOE, the Secretary of Education. So it would have been a really comprehensive look at the system. Um, which, frankly, you know, is due for some updating. Um, you, you know, you have all read about, um, you know, various schools in the state that are 
not either, either they're not fully staffed or they have low enrollment. We know that we have declining enrollment in the state. So what is our plan? What are we doing in the future? Um, I personally have sort of tried to champion or at least bring to light a little bit a system that we have in our state that is, I call it a bifurcated system where we have public dollars going to private schools. And ever since the Carson v. Macon Supreme Court decision, um, we now have to give those public dollars also to religious schools. So it is, in my mind, it's a problem and it's something that a lot of folks in Vermont don't know. They don't understand that it's happening. So these would all be things that would be on the table for us to look at and think about and plan for the future. So um, I just wanted to tell you that the yield bill contains um, you know, tax ramifications for sure, but also real ramifications for our education system moving forward. So I'm extreme, it's one of the bills, I'm upset about all of the vetoes, but that one in particular really hits home as someone who's been a champion of public education. So I will pass the microphone, because I see that a hand is going on the red sign to Abby Duke. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Abby Duke. I am the newest member of the legislature. Um, I represent Chittenden 17, which was Emma Mulvaney Stanek's district. So when she resigned, the governor appointed me to take her seat. Um, so I was sworn in on Monday morning of the last week of the session. So it was a bit of a whirlwind. Um, I live in Ward 7, um, and Chittenden 17 includes kind of the western side of Park Street to the lake, plus the waterfront. So a tiny bit of Ward 2, I think. Um, uh, and it's the only district in the city that is a single member. Um, so I spent the week and since just trying to learn and catch up and understand what, what's happening. Um, it, was a, it was definitely an interesting week to be there. Um, I joined the Commerce Committee, which was the committee that Emma had been on, um, Commerce and Economic Development. That committee was um, the, the committee that the data privacy bill came from. So I'll tell you a little bit about that bill. It is a, it's, it, it was a data privacy bill plus what they called kids code bill, which were combined into two bills. Uh, the kids code portion was really about common sense, privacy and safety safeguards for children online. Um, the data privacy portion Ha, well, had to do with data privacy, both but sort of data, biometric data, a bunch of different kinds of data. Um, and the, the piece that the governor really objected to, and I, I think the reason that, he, my understanding is the reason he vetoed it, is that there's a provision that allows private right of action, so individual citizens can sue a, a, a corporation that has misused their data. Um, it was pretty tightly defined, so the only corporations that you could do a private right of action was a, a company that had 100,000 or more individuals' data. So it was really the big data brokers and the big players. Um, so, and there were some, some safeguards in there for, for smaller Vermont businesses. So that I just learned from Jill when I was sitting there was vetoed, I think at the end of the day today, right? Hasn't even hit Digger. So you all are hearing it before others, so I think that's number seven. Um, and um, we'll see what happens Monday. Can I say something really quickly about, I just wanted to quickly say one other thing about the data privacy. I'm also on the Health and Welfare Committee and there, there are provisions in that bill also around healthcare pri data privacy and around like geofencing, around reproductive health clinics and things like that. So it's a really, really important bill. Um, and I did just want to mention the healthcare aspect of it as well. It's like a it's like hundred pages long, the bill. There's so much in it and re some really important things in it that are kind of wonky, but I think will really impact consumers. So I'm, I'm Senator Tanya Vyhovsky. I serve with um, Senator Gulick and Senator Baruth representing Chittenden Central, which represents most of Burlington, including wards two and three. Um, I sit on the Judiciary Committee as well as the Government Operations Committee, though most of the Government Operations bills seem to have not been vetoed. Um, there were two bills that came through Judiciary, one of them being the Restorative Justice Bill, which really sets up um, 
a streamlining of pre-charge restorative justice services, which will help ease some of the burden on our judiciary and ease some of the burden on our criminal justice system, allowing for the backlogs to hopefully improve. Um, and it creates more economic um, equity, or not economic, um, geographic equity. My brain is thinking economic equity. Um, it creates more geographic equity. So right now, Chittenden County does a fair amount of pre-charge um, restorative justice work, but other counties don't do it at all. And what this really says is that if they're going to be doing pre-charge restorative justice work, written policies need to be in place. Those policies need to be made public. Um, and that those dollars, rather than coming as they currently do through the Department of Corrections, will come from the Attorney General's office, which makes sense far more sense given that the people going through pre-charge have not been charged with a crime. Um, and therefore having them in, in sort of sucked into the correction system doesn't really make sense. Um, it's a long bill, it's a complex bill, it's a really important bill to stabilize and streamline that aspect of restorative justice work. There's a whole host of restorative justice work, both pre-charge and post-adjudication and juvenile, so there's, it's a really big system, and this does not solve all of the issues, but it takes one piece of it and seeks to not have it be a patchwork quilt of different funding streams and different ways of doing it here and different ways of doing it there, but really trying to create equitable access across the state and equitable funding streams so that that work can continue and be stabilized. Um, the governor's veto message was somewhat nonsensical to me in that he said that the Attorney General's office can't do this work, they don't have the capacity, but the Attorney General's office came to our committee and said that they very much want to do this work, and in fact have been partners in making this bill happen, and it was their office, they were the first people to reach out to me to say, oh my God, do you have the votes to override the veto? So it was interesting to me to hear the governor frame a message that they can't or don't want to do this work when we were, they were the biggest advocates for this bill. Um, so I think it's a really important bill to stabilize this aspect of our criminal justice system um, and to really move forward with different mechanisms of supporting people who are struggling and people who have been harmed in a way that is not necessarily grounded in retribution. Um, I could also talk about OPCs, but I'm gonna pass it to somebody else to do that because I imagine that you might wanna do that. <laughs> uh, hey everyone, I'm Phil Baruth. I'm one of your senators. Uh, from the Chittenden Central District. I also serve as Senate President Pro Tem. So when we're talking about the uh, veto override, that's my job, is to make sure that there are two thirds of the Senate ready and willing to vote to override the government. What that means is that all day, my phone has been blowing up every time somebody talks to a Senator and they indicate they are on the fence about anything, at which point I call the Senator, I'm sure Senator, uh, Representative Kerensky can uh, back this up. Constant attention to people and their voting, but we have a problem with the overdose prevention site bill, and that is that we lost Senator Dick Sears. You might have seen that. He was our 20th vote on OPCs. So literally, he died, his voice is now silent, and we are at 19. So we are going to people now who have expressed doubts, said they're not gonna vote for it, and trying to convince them. Um, the reason why I bring that up is that in the same way that my phone is blowing up with where people are on the issue, people who are um, you know, gonna be voting on this on Monday, the 30 senators, all of them are receiving communications from their constituents. It really matters. It really moves people if they get not a predetermined uh, message from a website where you click something, but a handwritten message uh, where you address them. It's coming from the heart. It's different from everybody. Five of those is worth 50 of just generated from a website. So between now and Monday, if the overdose prevention site is a bill that you care about, I would be in contact with senators uh, I think the people from our district are, are all solid, but um, other places in the state, there, there, are, um, there are people who could use messages. The other thing that I would say is, in addition to the overdose prevention site bill, there are bills like the Renewable Energy Standard, which 
to get us to all renewables by 2035. There's zero doubt in anybody's mind that this is a, a good thing, that this is a thing we should be doing, but there are some people who have received disinformation from entities that depend on fossil fuels. And so if you go back to the clean heat standard we had last year, there was a, a horrible smear campaign about that bill. Disinformation was sent to people in their heating bills. Uh, the legislature is trying to raise your heating bill by this much, all of it disinformation. Another pitch for you speaking directly to your senator or your house rep and saying, please uh, vote to override the governor. We need 100% renewables. In the case of the Overdose Prevention Center, we need a place where folks who are addicted can go to use, be safe, not use alone, and be connected to services. All the data shows that makes life in the neighborhood, the quality of life in the neighborhood, better. So um, I can promise you I'll be working from now until Monday at 11.30 or whenever it is we vote to get that last vote. But that's the one that I'm concerned about now. I believe we have 20 votes for um, the rest, although data privacy just came out, so we haven't voted out of that. But Representative Chief. So uh, I'm on the, I'm, I'm, I'm Brian Chino. I'm a state representative from Chittenden 15, which is uh, most of the of the east, most of Ward One, and then a piece of the old North End, my piece. So, um, so, so anyway, and also Riverside Ave now, which I kind of consider an extension of the old North End. We can debate that later, but like, um, but uh, but I'm going to frame the veto overrides in the overall work around healthcare because I'm a clinical social worker and I've served on the House Healthcare Committee for eight years. So this year, um, our, our I was like, your house, that's how we talk in the bloody, your house, Madam Speaker, your house, healthcare committee. That's how we would adjust that. I almost said that. Um, so our, the People's House Healthcare Committee, uh, we worked on um, some pretty significant legislation. And I, we saw action on things that for years we've been fighting for to try to improve the functioning of the healthcare system. And I have not seen the level of resistance to some of these initiatives um, around standing up to insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies. But in the face of that resistance, um, Vermont has moved forward with um, efforts to regulate pharmacy benefit managers, which are sort of like the middle people making a lot of money off of like basically dealing drugs, be, you know, not really dealing them. They're more like negotiating, you know, the dealing of drugs between pharmaceutical companies and pharmacists. So, um, and what I've learned is that there's many components of the healthcare system like this, where there's mid like sort of debt collectors and copay collectors, and like they're like loan sharks going after people for money, um, who are then profiting off of these practices. And we didn't do anything about those extra pieces yet, but we did learn a lot in our work with insurance companies around um, regulatory barriers and administrative practices that um, waste healthcare provider time and create stress for patients, like endless prior authorizations for routine things. And we made some progress there. The governor, though, in his one of his statements, claimed that we didn't hear from opponents on these on these bills, which is shocking because I've never seen like such an opposition in the healthcare committee to anything from opponents, um, except maybe people who were against um, gender affirming healthcare. That was pretty intense. But um, but I digress. So we also in the House Healthcare Committee. We worked on expanding access to Medicaid and Medicare, and I don't want to put the senators on the spot, but we were looking at expanding um, Medicare savings program. So 20,000 Vermonters over the age of 65, these are elders struggling to just make it every month, and they would have had two to $300 back in their pockets a month, and we were going to do it by drawing down federal money and raising our match by taxing corporations. But maybe senators could explain what happened in the Senate finance world, because I, I can't speak for that, but it got basically kind of whittled down. But at least there's a few thousand people getting that, and it's a step in the right direction. And there's also a, a fiscal analysis associated with it that looks at creating Medicaid as a public option, which I think is great, because that might be a step. So I only covered three things, and that's fine. <laughs> Thank you very much for that very informative, uh, quick overview. Um, so we'll open up for questions, and I believe we have a question on Zoom. If I saw someone had their hand raised, 
they would seem to have taken your hand down. But if you're still there and you'd like to ask a question, I'll keep an eye on Zoom. But we'll open it up to the audience and you stop. So um, there was that big tax thing that happened uh, with the school budgets and whatnot. And I'm wondering if it has you're excited about. Can I can I start with something that might not seem connected to this? Um, that yeah, I'm just gonna take advantage of it. All right. So um, I was talking with our joint fiscal office about the connection between the rising health, like many of us, healthcare pre premiums are skyrocketing. So one of the drivers of these uh, out of this out of control cost, you know, um, increases in public education is healthcare for teachers. Back to a, what's called a foundation formula. Um, which, you know, we have a very progressive um, way to pay for education. It's that really see stu each individual student for who they are and what they need. And we, we um, will vary funding depending on the needs of the students. That's actually a really um, equitable way to fund education. And we, um, with Act 127, we even furthered and we updated those weights that hadn't been changed for about 20 or 25 years so that they saw even more clearly what the needs of kids living in rural areas were, EL students, and um, students living in poverty. So um, I just want to say that I didn't see any new or creative suggestions at the end of the session. But again, I think the Commission on the Future of Public Education would would be thinking about those big ideas and some other, uh, you know, some other ways of funding education right now, using property taxes, as we all can see, is really harmful because it's it's a target and the rhetoric and the narrative right now is all about property taxes going up and too high and how do we pay for education really good question and i hope that i hope the yield bill passes so that we can do that work yeah thank you for the question uh one just quick thing before i pass the microphone down one of the conversations we've been having is what what are what our schools should be providing to students because as we've seen through covid even before COVID, but COVID made it much worse. The number of services, the social services that we are providing in our schools is more than we've ever had before. And so we're we're doing more of that support. And the question is, should should it be more of a community effort and some more of the community organizations be doing more of that work, for example? So I think it's not only about how we pay for it, but what does a strong, awesome public education system look like that we can be proud of. And the commission will be doing that work and looking at all these different options. And there will be avenues for a public engagement process um, for people to participate and voice their um, feedback and concerns too. Yeah, so one thing that I wanna stress is in Vermont, for as long as I've been here, which is 30 plus years now, We've always been a local control state. And what that means is your school board budgets. And there are no restrictions on your school board. They budget what they believe their need to be. And then voters are the check on that school. So what happened this year was school boards all around the state passed budgets. Those budgets get added together. And then we go last in the process. We raise the taxes to meet what the school boards put out and had voted on by the voters. So a lot of times when you read a story, it says that we are setting the tax rate at X. Trust me, we are not setting the tax rate. That is local school boards. If we do anything, it's to reduce the amount of taxes by you know, laboring for months to bring that total down. So if you go back to December, the December letter said, the tax rate would come in somewhere over 18%. Now, we immediately, when we came in in January, got to work on that. We did three or four very quick things, one of which was allowing communities to take a second vote with a skinnier budget. That brought taxes down some, and then we came up with a package in the yield bill, a lot of the spade work done by the House Ways and Needs Committee, um, and that reduced it from over 18% 
to 13.8. So we brought it down about a third. That's the most that we felt we could responsibly do because if you buy the whole rate down or even get it down into single digits, then next year you have to put in that same amount of money plus whatever the new cost is for next year. So when you buy the rate down, you're deferring payment, really. So all the way of saying we met with the governor yesterday and the governor came forward with his plan to go below 13% down to somewhere in the range of 5%. But in order to do that, we would have to reverse what we did on universal school meals. So we would now say that we don't have universal meals. We only have meals uh, for uh, students with demonstrated need, bringing back the old system that had the difference between the people who get school lunch, who don't get school lunch, we would also be bringing back food insecurity for a number of people. Um, the other thing he wanted to do was take the Ed Fund reserves, which is how we get a good bond rating from Wall Street. We have fully funded reserves. Vermont has an extremely high bond rating. What that means, it's like your credit score. So when we go out to borrow money, we get it for cheap because we have a really high bond rating. What the governor proposed is to take 100% of the reserve and spend it on tax cuts. And we were told by rating agencies that if we did that, they will tank our bond rating, everybody in the state will then pay more money. So we are standing firm on the work we did. We believe it reduces the tax burden as much as we can responsibly do. If you could just make this quick. And I will make it super fast. Um, I think this is all really important about this year. And one of the things that's not new, but I hope we will revisit it next year. Currently, the bottom 60% of people pay on income. And I think we need to bring in the top 40% of people and have them pay on income as well. So it is a more fair and equitable system. So moving away from a property tax to an income-based tax, because that top 40% is a fraction of a percentage of what the bottom 60% of earners are paying. So that is been floated around for 30 years, but I hope that we'll actually take it seriously next year. Great, thank you. Who has another question? Real real quick, uh, is every Chittenden County Senator um, on board to, uh, to override? And if not, I see Martine saying no, then who is, who is not so that we can focus on them? Well, how, well, I was thinking about the overdose prevention sites, but I would think that it would be very helpful since there are seven important bills that we knew who, because it's it's a lot harder and for me to be very effective if I call a Rutland senator, but uh, a senator who lives in South Burlington, uh, I know a senator in South Burlington, I've worked with him before, perhaps a call from me would, uh, I don't know if it'll be helpful, but at least it'll get me more satisfied about my own self. I, I believe that all the senators from Chittenden County are solid on the overdose prevention center bill, no? The, Thomas Chittenden, is, is he? Is he, uh, well, Okay. Okay. So Thomas Chittenden would be the exception. Um, yeah. I, I, that is Andy Julo, who was just appointed. Um, so I don't think those are, I'm sorry? Yes. Um, so, so, and he hasn't said publicly what? I don't, um, I don't believe so. Not on that. Okay. Is, is everyone going to, Sorry, I do know because we're so into this bill and making sure it passes. I did see a note um, that the new senator posted saying, I think that he's looking for more information from people on this. So um, reach out to him. Okay. Is, is every, are, are representatives in the House also reaching out to them and, and work? Abby, do you support an OPC? Thank you. Yeah, all of the Burlington state rep support uh, overriding all of the bills. So it's just the new senator replacing Maza and uh, Chittenden. 
uh, and that and the only bill that they're um, off it on is the oversight uh, overdose prevention or no? I would say that's the only one where I think we have a problem getting to money. I think there are available signs. I, I think there are other paths for the other bills to get to 20. The OPC bill is the is the one where we really need people who have declared a, a reluctance or said no need to hear from us. It, it, it would be helpful for us in Chittenden County to know how our Chittenden County senators um, are voting well, on all these important things. So anything that you can do to give that information to us so that we can uh, reach out to them because what happens here is important to the folks in Colchester and if they're doing the Grand Isle and South Burlington, et cetera. So, uh, and what happened, it, yeah, it, it, and vice versa. So um, I, I think that we've, you know, as a county, uh, there is a connection that they need to feel responsible and we need to impress upon them that. So across the board, even though if you have a, a path, I don't know, maybe, uh, well, Jill's my rep, one of them, but you could, you know, to, to send maybe folks, I, I would at least like to, to, to be clear about the contacts that, we need to make and for what bills. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like can to make time. Last, can I just say one quick thing? So last night there was a legislator who was extremely critical of the government, of the governor's management style. And I just wondered if, if you just give me a quick A to, a to F of how you would rate your communication and your relationship with the governor as far as getting things done in the legislature. Because the criticism was basically the governor is not involved in any to, to any great degree in anything, and he only gets involved after the legislature has already passed something. Is that do you give him an A or an F? For you? I would give him a D. After the pandemic, um, I think during the pandemic, he 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 shown he was calm and he as, as a public official he he sort of it reminded me of a conservative FDR at first. You know, he was trying to bringing people peace of mind through that like mellow voice and that calm demeanor. But I, you know, I question what happened to the compassionate conservative with him? Because what he does is he, for, for the eight years I've been there, he's, he moves the goalposts every time you make a deal. I meet with them and it's, it's polite, but then they like, I don't, I hate to say it, but they deceive me. They've deceived me. And it's, and, and I go on and on, but let me just give you one example of the hypocrisy. I had it down on my list that the governor recommended a 3% raise for designated agency, a uh, 0% raise for the designated agencies. And in full disclosure, I work as a substitute at the Howard Center. So for frontline healthcare workers, 0% raise. And the House and Senate compromise gave a 3% raise. The governor complains about us spending money, but then he wants to spend our reserves. And on top of all that, in the budget, he and 348 people who make 100 grand a year in his administration are getting a 6.4% raise, twice as much as our frontline healthcare workers. He's going to be the second highest paid governor in the United States, second only to New York State, and our state budget is 3% that of New York State. So I put this out there because to me, it's offensive to have a leader criticizing us. Uh, I'm getting a little mad, okay? And then they say, when I get mad like this, they say, you're not being civil. So when disenfranchised people are angry, we're we're like wrong, but you can smile and be nice and and throw people out of hotels, block people from getting Medicaid eligibility, you know, um, veto a compromise on pensions. This happened in the past. That was that then it was the first time in Vermont history the entire legislature overrode a veto, I think, unanimously. Even the Republicans did, because he just came in at the end and vetoed it. So I sorry, but like if a, we need a leader who's going to come to us with ideas and who's going to come to the table in good faith. And after eight years, I can't defend him. Moving on. I, I said, I don't, I could read it. I could read him longer, but that's my opinion. That's really hard to, I know we're short on time. So I would just say um, I, a lot of people don't know this. We have 1100 around 1100 vacancies right now in state government jobs. That's huge. So just think about our incredible state employees who are trying to fill the roles of two or three jobs. So right now, our government is not there for people like they need to be. Phones aren't being answered. Emails aren't being replied to. 
and it's not fair. And so uh, that's one point I would raise that a lot of people don't know about. And I try my best to communicate with the governor. We meet and talk a lot, um, but actions speak louder than words. And what we see in these vetoes is a representation of his lack of leadership. Thank you. That's, that's a big question that um, we could talk about for a long time, but we are running short on time. I wanted to make time for one last question. We have a really valuable panel, so uh, you get our last question. Uh, how does this number, it seems like just watching the news, every bill seems like it's getting vetoed or like so many bills. Is this like unusual? Like it feels almost like lame duck, like presidency. I don't know. He set a record. I don't know how many, but he has he exceeded the record in past terms, right? They went. Well, so the previous record was held by Howard Dean, and he accumulated it over twelve years, and I believe it was twenty-one. And our current governor is over fifty, yeah. and he's done that in eight years. So it's unusual across the board. It's not unusual this year. This is seemingly how we do things now. Is is we just veto. We rule by veto. Just one thing to add there. Uh, that is true. The governor has had an extreme amount of vetoes, but last year we overrode him six times, which has also never been done in history. Where usually if there's a veto override, it's a huge deal. We overrode him six times, including the budget. We will override him, I would say, at least getting us into double figures this time. So this is the way it works in representative democracy. He's out of control and there's a check in the system, which is a legislature that is united to get those bills to. Hopefully we can unite and cut the budget for his ink pen, the pen. Yeah, should be on supporting. Um, thank you for your uh, sharing, your presence, and your uh, points of view. I think we got a clear idea of uh, uh, what you're thinking. Um, in another area, I'm interested in knowing, uh, in spite of the problems with the court system and our judiciary, and in spite of the very serious issues with uh, the unhoused people, addiction, and uh, mental, mental health issues. I'm, as, as a resident, I'm very concerned about accountability. Um, what we teach people when there is no accountability is that it's okay to, uh, it's okay to do what you're doing. If I don't show up for court, if I harm somebody, if I threaten somebody and there's no consequence, um, we're setting up, uh, we're building problems that you're seeking to solve. And um, uh, the final thought is uh, the data that I heard that um, people have referred to that in 19, uh, in 19, what well, no, 2000, 2019, our, our, uh, the data shows, and I think uh, you shared this in an interview recently, uh, that, that uh, we were much worse off in, in 2019 than we are today. Um, what, A, the data isn't right because there isn't the reporting that's happening, at least from our business. We're not reporting because we only have this much time in a day. And if you report and you don't get uh, action, that data is lost. Um, so I just want to share that one thing that's different, in my opinion, than 2019 is the violence that accompanies things that we used to call theft or shoplifting or this or that. Violence is 
at a new level. And I just, uh, I, I challenge you to, to think about that and how we, how accountability, a focus on accountability, and I'm not saying incarceration, but I'm saying a focus on accountability with teeth can change behavior. We're not doing that now, in my opinion. So one thing I'd encourage you if you haven't watched the entire interview and not just the clip, because that clip was taken wildly out of context about what I was saying. Um, I, and, and I appreciate that. And I watched the clip and the whole interview and it was it did not accurately depict what I was saying. Uh, secondly, um, accountability is important. And I think there are one of the biggest things that we know from Department of Justice data is that increased penalty does not actually deter crime, but swift action does. And so when we have a judiciary system that has thousands of cases backlogged and five years or six years before anyone is held accountable, it's never going to work. And so one of the things that I think was really important that we did do is expand a couple of additional judges to the judiciary system. But I don't want to see us, because increased felonies and increased incarceration rates actually increase the rate of recidivism. So I want to see us doing things to hold people accountable, but things that work. And one of the things we really have to address is the backlogs of the judiciary system. And we have to back address all of the economic drivers that drive people to engage in that behavior anyways, which is addressing the housing issue, addressing adequate mental health funding and adequate substance use funding so that people are getting the services and supports that they need. And so I agree with you wholeheartedly that we absolutely need to respond, but I don't want to see us respond in a way that we know from decades of experience doesn't work. I would love to show you videotape of someone in with someone with you know serious mental health issues that did some things in the garages, did some things to our business. Um, asked the police on the tape, please take me away. And shortly after, there were 23, um, uh, he damaged 23 homes in the South End, was eventually put in jail, and I believe involved in a murder, in a death. I'm not so there, if, uh, it's very hard to have appropriate consequences, but sometimes people are even asking for help and we can't get them. And there's no help. You know, the, the criminal justice system is the very last place we want to give people help. It's not trauma informed. It's not going to be. So, you know, that's where I'm saying I want to see us invest in the community supports and services. So someone doesn't reach the point where they're begging to go to jail. That's pretty sad for our society as a whole. And I'm not saying that harm isn't being done and that we don't need to do a better job responding to that harm, which again, if you watch that whole interview, I talk a lot more about this nuance. They grabbed one little clip. Yeah, Thank, you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you very much. It's a super important topic. I hate to cut you off, but please continue the conversation after the meeting. Um, really appreciate all of you making the time to come out and meet with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for your heart. We have one last item to our meeting, which is to pull the raffle. So I'm gonna ask Lauren to pull a name. If you're still here, you'll win our raffle prize of two candles and some cards. Oh, you gotta be here to win the raffle. Megan, not Tegan. Megan or Tegan? Megan still here? Megan, you win the door prize. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful month. We'll see you in July.